You are listening to Mist Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Mist Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Spanners Ready. Deep breath and relax after that exciting and unpredictable start to the F1 season. There's a lot of folk complaining about an off weekend, but here we are uh, in the sheds and we've always enjoyed the off weekends. In fact, we've enjoyed the off season a lot of the time as well. A gap between the races and the seasons lets you digest all that F1 in your motorsport belly. And they say the best way to get kids to remember holidays is to sit down afterwards and get them to remember the things they like and the things they remember, just to get those memories baked in. So if we don't have any gap weeks, maybe we lose the chance to stop and smell the E10 petrol. And it feels like we've had a good half a season's worth of drama and intrigue already, but it's way, way, way too early to jump to conclusions and wild speculation. Coming up on Missed Apex this week, we speculate wildly and jump to conclusions. We ask which teammates are best buddies. We look into the upgrades coming to Imola and we rate our listener hot takes collected from the patron Slack, Slack group earlier this afternoon. We are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. <laughs> I'm joined in the shed by Matt Two Rumpets. Hello, Matt. Hello there. Not furiously typing into the internet because someone is currently wrong about a Formula One statistic. Stop trolling the internet, Matt. We're joined by Jules Sagers from the Netherlands. Hi, Spanners. Coming to you from the country where a poll showed, an internet poll showed, that not even half of Max Verstappen fans or would you say still almost half of Max Verstappen fans believe he can defend his title successfully still? Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll get into Max's championships hopes. And we're joined by TikTok star Antonio Rankin. Hello, Antonia. Hi, thank you for having me back. Mm-hmm. Let's get on with the news. <laughs> Now, we might just uh, start with you, Antonia, actually, because you did a a good TikTok where you listed the things that are currently irking you about Formula One. I thought we might go through some of those and we'll see if you're being oversensitive or or bang on the money. Do you want do you want to kick us off? What was the what was the TikTok post and how did you put it? Well, one of my favorite things about my TikTok is I get to throw in my two cents whenever I want to, and no yeah. one gets to tell me to be quiet. So I capitalized on that opportunity naturally. And I thought, okay, well, what's 10 things that, for example, I would change about the sport or that isn't necessarily my favorite thing about F1? Okay. So hit us with one of them. Okay. So, for example, um, the single team dominance that's really happening since the turbo hybrid era. Ah, but. The single team dominance has just been mostly by one team. It might not be an inherent feature of F1 or the turbo hybrid era, unless the turbo hybrid era, unless Ferrari can go on and start dominating for a few seasons. Matt? Well, I I think you saw hints of that in the previous generation at the end of the V8 with Red Bull. Yeah. And I can remember a mini a race going, oh, look, Sebastian Vettel in the lead. Oh, look, Sebastian Vettel, a pit stop ahead. Oh, wow. I'm so excited for this sport. Uh, yeah. And before that, of course, you had Ferrari running away with season after season in the late noughties and early 2000s. Uh, Red Bull, of course, at the uh, beginning of the last decade. And and even like a team like Braun, they got such a head start at the start of a regulation change that they were able to go and, and win a championship without developing further but are you not are you not satisfied antonia by some of uh, ross braun's comments that they might start clipping the wings of teams that get too far ahead and I, which by the way i really disagreed with that when it was going to be lewis hamilton and mercedes but now i'm a bit more you know i'm more chill like they can do that if they want yeah i don't know i definitely think a lot of the new things that they've implemented can definitely help to combat the just complete dominance that we've seen from Mercedes the last, what, six, seven years. Um, but I mean, my, my issue with it isn't from the fact that it's one team dominating, because 
I don't think Mercedes have been particularly complacent with their dominance. I think they've had a very good attitude towards it. They haven't been up themselves or taken anything for granted, which is really great to see. However, just from a fan's perspective, it is more interesting to see people challenging each other, seeing new people at the front of the grid every weekend. Matt? Oh, no, I would agree. I'm delighted to see new fights at the front. It's exciting to see Mercedes having to try and make a comeback after all the years at the front. But if I'm thinking about this and I really want to irritate someone, I might say it might also show you how much more important the engine is than the aerodynamics. Ah, yeah. So do you think we're still in an engine formula? Because that was the big complaint, especially in 2014, when uh, Williams basically turned up with no aero and every race for them was a series of rocket launchers, get it stopped if possible, then then rocket launcher again into the next uh, into the next straight. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think rather than saying we're out of an, it, I think we're into an era of engine parody, if that makes any sense. Like, like the people, everyone has caught up on the engine front. Yeah. But look at how long it took them to do that compared to the last set of, say, aero regulation changes. All right. Well, we'll put Antonia, we've put her in charge for, for a little while here. Uh, what you might be advocating, incidentally, though, is moving towards more spec series. Because if we have open regs and an engineering competition and only 10 teams and only four of them that realistically have the budget to challenge right at the top, aren't we kind of deliberately lending ourselves to one team coming out and dominating? Yeah, but I suppose, like I said, there's a lot of new procedures that have been implemented or will be implemented soon that hopefully will kind of just take the edge off of that a bit. So, for example, I think the budget caps were a really great step in the right direction. Um, But I also think the sliding scale for aerodynamic testing could be really interesting going into future seasons. So the amount of time that teams are allowed to get testing in the wind tunnel, for example, will be decided by performance throughout the season from a halfway point, but then also at the end. So I think there's like an 115% allocation to the team that finishes 10th or any new team. So that gives them a bit more time than the teams at the top of the grid. And it might it might not see the grid change around too much. It likely won't, because if a Williams gets more time in an aero tunnel than a Mercedes, that's probably not going to make much of a difference. But it could take the edge off and shake things up a little bit. OK, so what we've got is a performance balance through engineering resources and making it just a little bit quicker. So. I mean, Braun wouldn't have lost their their title by doing it this way, by having to ha- by having to get rid of aero time, but it would have stopped maybe the blown diffuser of the Red Bull dominating after twenty eleven. You know, for twenty twelve and twenty thirteen, it might have restricted them there a little bit. I I like uh, I liked one of your next ones, which was a uh, cost related ones, which was uh, ticket prices and merchandise. Uh, Jules, been meaning to ask you, did you go? to Zandvoort last I, season? No, I did not. Why? Did not. Why? Um, because uh, the tickets sold out like crazily. Oh, did they? I think they could have sold it out three times or something. So uh, I just wasn't able to uh, to get my hands on. So does that mean it was priced reasonably to sell out like that? I believe um, the ticket prices weren't like outrageous. Uh, it was mostly the accommodations uh, around the circuit in the area that just went ice hockey stick uh, high yeah ah okay yeah and silverstone as well is notoriously very very expensive i think that's possibly your point here is it's expensive to be an f1 fan antonia absolutely i mean obviously this is a crazy example but monaco's general admission is nearly a thousand pounds per ticket which is so it's ast- it's astonishingly expensive and you look at merch prices it's 140 quid for a hoodie yeah. and generally speaking being an f1 fan is being more and more expensive because the sports move to subscription only presenting so for example sky sports you have to pay to watch f1 it's not on bbc anymore um and generally speaking just being an f1 fan and loving the sport and being able to actually engage with it is really expensive See, I wonder, Matt, are the the American Grand Prix doing anything different? Because it's talking about bringing it into the heart of Las Vegas, Miami, already in Austin. Is is it going to be any, is it any more affordable over that side? Um, I don't know about Austin. Austin might be affordable-ish. But for Las Vegas and certainly for Miami, no, it's high rollers. They're going to sell, because they're running down the strip, they're going to sell 
every front facing hotel suite at a ridiculous premium and make stupid amounts of money uh, it, it's so hard to justify especially like as a as a dad like we went shopping because uh, for t-shirts because my body shape goes from between a, a full on malteser shape uh, to uh, a slightly less Malteser shape. So I have to go shopping quite often. I do vary about a stone between heaviest and lightest. So we went to get some some clothes and we, we were looking at these shops and £40 for a nice t-shirt. No way can I justify that when there's kids who want coding lessons and uh, Lego and a bike and food. Every day they whine for food. Uh, but when it comes to merchandising, uh, what did you say that hoodie was like was, over a hundred pounds for a, for a team hoodie. Yeah. I, see, that's crazy, Matt. I could, n there's nothing on this earth as a 41 year old dad that could make me spend a hundred pounds. And even if I became much more financially solvent, there would be a deep rooted stinginess and chips on my shoulders that would just go, no. Yeah. And it's funny that I think some of the oldest European races actually are some of the best bargains. I hear Monza is pretty cheap. And spa can be, uh, you can find some deals at spa as well. Yeah, spa is, uh, especially because there are large general admission areas. Um, it's, it's a good one to go to in that aspect. But of course, the track being so long and the lap only uh, has 44 laps, uh, the race only has 44 yeah. laps. It means you don't get to see the cars pass that much. And the, uh, like in Austria, uh, short lap time, uh, certain uh, uh, positions in the stands there, they allow you to almost overlook the whole track. So a lot of Dutch guys uh, go to Austria for a reason. So I'm a little bit triggered from someone saying there that the Monaco Grand Prix general admission, a thousand pounds. So all those people that are saying you have to be there, I'm assuming that's for the weekend, but they're still expecting me to shell out for a thousand pounds. And presumably that's not even your own seat. You could probably get a grandstand seat on the Friday, but the rest of the time, what are you doing? You're poking up over a, a barrier, trying to see something. Yeah, that is... See, you're okay, Matt, because you're very long. Yeah, for me, I would I would need two of me on each other's shoulders, and we're still jumping. Yeah, see, I, I'm maybe taking a different thing. I'm thinking if you can afford that ticket, you're already living your best life. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? If you have to ask how much the Monaco tickets are, you can't afford it. So the second you say, how much for this ticket? They're like, dude... This is not for you. This is for people who just get their their wallet out. Um, there's a couple left in your list that I liked, but Jules, jump in first. Yeah, maybe just one um, uh, public service announcement uh, for our listeners as well. Because the merch prices are so ridiculously high, uh, end of season though, they, uh, they sell out uh, for like crazy yeah. amounts of discounts, especially if a team... Uh, gets rid of one of the drivers. <laughs> the, the the merch is, gets so uh, so cheap. So best to wait for that part of the season. And that was the trick I used to use as a kid. And you'd always get the out of date England shirts when yeah. they're when they're being cleared out. Because come the next season, when you wear it, all you say is, "Oh, I just haven't got the new. Oh, I haven't got the new shirt yet." But I totally had it last year. You can you can ask you can ask my cousin. He saw me in it, but he goes to a different school, so you, you can't really ask him right now, Matt. I was just, the chat room is getting into it, saying that pay fans are really ruining the sport. Yes, these pay fans. But <laughs> it, it, it speaks to the massive popula popularity of Formula One that Miami, a, a town with no, no F1 heritage, have they had a Grand Prix before? They've not had a Grand Prix before, have they? Have embraced it to the point that it sold out almost instantly, Matt, Miami. Like, it's impossible. We were thinking of doing an event out there, no press accreditation, but we thought, and this was months ago, Maybe we can just get general admission on the Friday so it's at least worth going there. You couldn't get anything. No, um, I, there, there was a race in Miami that I'm thinking of. I don't know if it's a Grand Prix, but it's got zero, I'm aware of, uh, Formula One history. Um, and it, and it, it is exactly the kind of thing that Formula One has gotten very adept at turning up to a yeah. brand new place, in Crazy. this case, footing the bill themselves because there was that whole thing with, uh, was it Donald Ross? With a Ross who owns the Miami Dolphins. That's a baseball, Is American football or basketball team. It's Stephen Ross, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, um, he was a bidder for F1 and now magically has a race for free in his very own stadium. Not that I'm saying there was anything that happened in the bidding for Formula One. <laughs> Let's not make allegations. The lawyers are listening. Um, and, and But this is the kind of event they've gotten very good at just creating out of thin air. And weirdly, the COVID era, I think, has honed that skill. Jules, you've got a comment in the live chat there. Paddy's saying, are you telling me that Mazepin hoodies are on discount? You and me, let's get on there before they sell out. Exactly what I'm saying, but he needs to be quick, though, because I'm thinking of buying them all. Yeah, what we'll do is we'll ask Matt to talk about tyres, and then we'll have 25 minutes to go and buy our <laughs> Mazepin hoodies. Uh, but yeah, you talk about those European races, and I've been looking at going to Monza or Spa for a, a long time and looking at the flights. Obviously, with COVID, that kind of got curtailed. But a lot of times, it definitely works out cheaper to get a flight out to Europe, go and stay in a hotel, uh, and then and then watch the Grand Prix. The the hard sell, when we talk about the kind permission of our better halves, that's a different story, Jules. I probably wouldn't get the pass for the whole weekend. Probably not. But one of the best and apparently uh, cheapest options is Hungary, um, because it's not from, far from uh, from uh, Budapest. And taxis are cheap and uh, tickets aren't too expensive. A uh, lot of laps uh, in the race. Yes. So yeah. um, it's, it's uh, um, uh, traditionally uh, one of the cheaper European races. And that would be a good one. As long as you've got yourself in a view of turn one and two, you're probably okay if you can see it up the hill. You know that that's the order when they come back around. It's going <laughs> yeah. to be that. Uh, let's yeah. work down Antonia's list as well. We've got a lot to get through, actually, um, this week but there's there's a couple of your items on there that what we're we calling these your you should call it uh, what grinds antonia's gears that's what you should call it your grievances what's next um so like the general accessibility of the sport from a fan's perspective but also as a just generally speaking as a fan of the sport i've watched f1 since i was this big you know something that i've been involved with my whole life yeah. um but i do find that the fans as a community can be very, very hostile. And obviously maybe that's just coming from, obviously I'm a girl. I know that it's very typically a guy's space and I'm yeah. coming into that and intruding a little bit. How but dare you? Dare you? Well, yeah. exactly. But generally speaking, I do find that, and it's not all fans, it's such a small number yeah. of kind of the, I think the phrase we, I use is gatekeeping where a lot of people kind of, when you're so passionate about something, you kind of want to keep it to yourself sometimes. Yeah. So, And a lot of people, especially with the Drive to Survive era, have found Drive to Survive fans a little bit jarring and want to keep, shut them out. But I, I, don't, I don't like that very much, to be honest. I've actually got an email here from, from Dan, and you can email us feedback at mistapex.net. I'd love your reactions to, to this. Hi there. Uh, is a demographic data point for you. I'm a brand spanking new F1 fan in the USA. My wife and I finished season four of Drive to Survive after about two weeks into the season, and we needed... Uh, uh, we, we wanted to follow it despite having never followed any other kind of racing series. So this is it's bringing in, even in the UK, like my family, it's bringing in people who weren't interested in any form of racing are now mad about F1. Dan continues, I learned about the podcast uh, when you jumped on the Ringer podcast with Kevin Clark. And I just wanted to thank you, and this is the relevant bit, for being a warm and welcoming voice as we navigate the strange and fascinating world. Y'all have done a great job explaining here's what to look for and how to approach certain things but without being gatekeepy uh, it's refreshing to see you and the rest of your host excited for more fans instead of being annoyed by us it's folks like us who will make it who are that's what his point is that if we are nice to the people that come in and not gatekeepy they're more likely to hang around uh, rather than it just being a fad for a season or two but the gatekeeping definitely exists antonia but i think here we've had we've had specific conversations to try and not do that. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, definitely from a personal perspective, one of my favorite things about having the platform I have is I get to just chat people's ears off about something that I love. You know, I'm sure you're in mm. a very similar position. It's ex <laughs> it's, well, it's exactly that, because when we were growing up uh, with Formula One, we were like the niche nerds and didn't have any friends who were into F1. <laughs> All the old men on the panel are, are nodding along. Yeah, that's that's definitely what happened. But, you know, it doesn't take long from our point of view, does it, Matt, to go, oh, uh, if someone asks a question about DRS, we can go, yeah, DRS, it's the flap that just reduces your downforce for a bit on the straight where you don't need it. 
if you're behind a car and it can help you overtake. Now, let's look a little more in depth. Like it does with such an influx of new fans, it, it doesn't really take a lot of time just to quickly do a, what do you call it? A primer, a quick primer on things. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important to react to a genuine question for information versus uh, an easy way to exclude new people from the sport. You yeah. know, like, I, I think you need to not assume people don't know unless they ask what's being talked about. And uh, Antonia, I'm assuming that you run into a lot of comments on TikTok where people will assume you're coming from a low knowledge base because you are a young woman. Yeah, and that's something I really I really do try to address it on my channel because I do think it is just so important that people don't come into, you know, seeing new people in a sport with a closed mindset. Yeah. Because a lot of people do, oh, I get a lot of comments. It's like, drive to survive, fan, drive to survive, fan. You don't know what you're talking about. And I just think, well, if you kind of sit and listen, I promise I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's just, I think a lot of people, it's their first instinct kind yeah. of to shut out what's unfamiliar, isn't it? Well, it's become like an almost a class system in the wrong places where you go, oh, you're just a drive to survive fan, which is incredibly unfair. So I hope here at Miss Apex that we are welcoming of, of uh, old codgers who've been watching it since year 1966 and people who've just come in as well. And if we ever are guilty of gatekeeping or you need us to explain something, do feel free to email matt at mistapex.net because he reads he reads words good. Um, but the other thing you, you talked about related to this was toxic fans. And for those of you who go on social media, I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, a lot of these guys are on Instagram, which I find impossible. Of, of course, TikTok as well. You do get that toxicity. I am of the opinion. And we were speaking, obviously, to Will Buxton last week about some of the challenges he's faced as a very prominent person with social media is I think it's a very small proportion of, pe of, of fans who are interacting that are toxic. I think collectively, let's start like a campaign or a hashtag to just block them. So let's just block turnips. If I do a hashtag, hashtag block turnips, maybe it will catch on. Hashtag block F1 turnips, just systematically start blocking them. They'll get the message. I don't think it will take that long. I think it's a relatively small amount of people. And uh, we'll just end with, are you talking about um, a lack of diversity as well, Antonia? Yeah, and that's not just with the drivers. That's everyone in the sport, you know, in terms of race, gender, everything about it. I do think, obviously, historically, and there's nothing wrong with it. Historically, F1 has been very Europe-centric. That's where it kind of was developed. That's where it stayed for a long time. And now it's really nice, actually, to see it branching out a lot. It's nice to see a lot of diversity in the countries where circuits are being held. So like we said, in America, I think there's a bit of talk about a South African Grand Prix, yeah. which would yeah, be yeah. really interesting. And I do think it's something really to embrace about F1. Thanks to, thanks to Drive to Survive, actually. We've got so many new fans across the world. You know, before Drive to Survive, viewer numbers were falling and because of the pay, paid subscription services like Sky that a lot of people are watching it on. It wasn't accessible for a long time. So actually having a diverse set of people in the sport, a diverse set of tracks around the world mm. helps make the sport really accessible and, to be honest, a lot more interesting. Yeah, and it, that rising tide of interest will raise all ships. But I think it's important here to zone in on, on jewels here. And I, I think Antonia is making very clear that you, as a white male, straight, European, middle-aged dad, you're exactly the problem. And, and if you could apologise, I, I think that would help heal a lot of wounds, if I'm honest. Hey, hey, I'm I'm already busy apologising for all the Max Fosey <laughs> yeah. So Okay, well, in that case, let's go there. Let's go there next. Let's talk about Max Verstappen. We're seeing a, a, a somewhat surprising side of him. He's being animated. He's being negative. He does not seem to have confidence, not in himself, but confidence in his chances this season. What's the, what's the skinny with Max and Red Bull? Yeah, it, and I'm surprised myself, especially because we got to know Max in first instance as a very lighthearted, uh, you know, fun, funny guy. And then especially last season when he was in the title race and at this fierce rivalry, he, he was always so 
sharp and sometimes a bit bitter or cynical and he would always um, uh, repeat in the media that he wasn't stressed or wasn't feeling any uh, yeah, any he, he uh, like, nerves I, I, I don't even care i don't even yeah, care if i win yeah, the championship yeah, it's like yeah. if i lose the championship i'll just go to Blidl and get yeah uh, it didn't really I'll matter get, I'll get if two he ice creams it. yeah yeah exactly. it wouldn't change his, his life if he won it or not and it seems like it it has as does of course it it, it changes life and um he came out after Melbourne uh, saying he would need probably 45 races to close this gap. Uh, Christian Horner came out to say uh, Stepan is a changed man, of course, because mm. he won his first title. It relieves him from a lot of pressure that drivers feel winning a first title. But um, it almost uh, came across to me as if he isn't as sharp. He isn't as, um, how do you say this? He isn't as um, feisty uh, in in the battles on track. Um, that I, that I kind of felt like is this, and I made this word up. Is this maybe a a Rosberg syndrome? Like if you were so into one season, giving it your all, you know, and mm. and then you won it, and then it's just not possible in that into the next season to to do that all over again. That's really interesting. And he did talk a little bit. And I think Red Bull have talked about how much the last season took out of everyone, the big push to get over the line. And they they did get, get over the line, whether, whether, you know, whether people here might like it or not. It did happen. He is the world champion. And then uh, approaching a, a challenge now that, A, he wasn't expecting Ferrari to tip up and be ahead, and B, wasn't expecting his car to conk out. How do you then dig deep and find the resolve to to care about this season. I get, it would be very easy to just throw your hands up in the air and go, no, we're, we're written off this season. Now we'll look forward to next season. Especially, you know, because just like you said, they, they are surprised. Obviously, everyone's surprised by it, by the Ferrari pace. But then the, the, the only uh, race he didn't um, uh, DNF, he won. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of perspective still. But... I think the the um, uh, how fast the season seems to 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 uh, fall out of out of his hands, it just yeah, it's it's almost like it it's it's a bit numbing or something. Uh, yes, and if let's let's definitely jump to the wild conclusion that it is all over for Red Bull and Max Verstappen. But that does beg the question: Does Max Verstappen think he has a championship winning car? Uh, Antonia, does he have a championship winning car? thing is they're trailing in the championship now by 49 points max is what sixth in the championship he's five points behind perez i won't lie it does look dire for red bull and what helmet marco has allegedly said is that the car's issues are not just the reliability but also they've got a surplus of other stuff going on starting with the fact that the car is too heavy yeah. And the weight of the car is not a cheap fix. It's a huge financial thing to have to sort through and fix and go through. And it's just not something that with budget caps, you can't redo your whole car to make it lighter. So in terms of actually winning the championship, yeah, there's quite a lot going on to make that happen, really. And now, see, Jules was talking about maybe the emotional energy that Verstappen had put into last season, but there's also the engineering energy that they put into last season and they they sort of have come out of the gate with a on paper fast car mat but you know this is what me and carl were speculating about if it's overweight if they're having reliability issues from a design engineering process me and kyle's brains both did this kind of ding 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 where it's a few iterations behind where you would want it to be this is like an it's almost like the prototype you go yeah we've got the proof of concept ah it keeps falling apart let's add bits it, I mean, we know it's heavy and you have to say to the end customer, we know it's heavy. It's not going to be like this when it actually gets delivered to you. So maybe all this talk about it then being, you know, under-resourced and, and having dedicated engineering stuff to 2021, maybe it's not mad. No, I don't think it's mad at all. How could a championship like that not take away from the resource for this season? Does he have a championship winning car? Well, potentially he had a championship winning car before it didn't finish two of the first three races. And I think if you're a driver, you're opting out of the mental pressure as rapidly as possible. And it's not, see, you say that, it's not just that. It's a question of how easy is it to balance the car on 
tracks with wildly different demands. Mm -hmm. I think the Red Bull is going to be a very track specific car this season. And if you're going to have a car like that, you need to finish all of the races as high as you can. Yeah, I, I'm really hoping we have track specific cars. So like, I, I hope we, we turn up at Miami and suddenly you have like an Alpine turning up for, for a victory. But, but I'll tell you what, do we think that reli- if the reliability holds together, because it's always a, a risk reward with performance versus reliability, Jules, if, if they decide to keep going for, uh, for performance and, and it holds up, do we, do we still think at the core... There's a championship winning car there, or has the Netherlands just given up? <laughs> <laughs> no, the Netherlands never gives up. Um, we're NATO members, etc. No, uh, of course it it could be a championship winning car. I have no doubt about it. They had a they had a solid preseason. I think I, I believe uh, they came out of uh, out of testing, going uh, to Bahrain, thinking uh, they they would they would cruise it, and they l- looked like doing it. Um, so no doubt they can uh, they can strike back. The thing I would say about that is, whilst if they can get the car to finish the races, obviously that's a huge part of the battle. But their weight is costing them three tenths per lap to Ferrari, which I just really? think is yeah. So uh, allegedly, allegedly the car is the weight of the car is costing them a good amount of time at least to the Ferraris and. Yeah, the car needs to finish weight races to get points. That's a huge, a huge part of it. And the car does look like it has pace. However, over the course of the season, if if it's continuing to look like this, it's not overly optimistic. Yeah, I, I, it's a 10 kilogram deficit to Ferrari is what I have heard. And that is exactly three tenths of a second per lap. That's not going to help. The good news for Red Bull is they seem to be the first and best team at solving the porpoising problem, which Ferrari is working on right now. And Mercedes, interestingly, doesn't seem to have a clue about quite yet, although they're gathering lots of data, I hear. Okay. Just to, uh, what did you say? It was 10 kilograms? 10 kilograms. Okay. That's 14 furlongs for for you Brexiters, just so that you you understand the imperial measurements. What's it in stones, (laughs) though? going to throw you a solid map. I'm going to ask you and Antonia, who has a seems to have a disturbingly close interest in tyres uh, as you, about the tyre temperatures. Who wants to kick that off? Because obviously the tyre blanket situation has changed. The, the hard tyres look risky at best. Antonia, what do you make of these, uh, these new tyre temp struggles people are having? Yeah, it's really looking like this season, the teams are really struggling with finding the balance in the tyres between the temperatures, maintaining them for the amount of time that they're meant to last for. Obviously, with the new regulations, the tyre blankets that teams are allowed to use are a lot cooler. Um, I think that comes from primarily environmental concerns for the sport. But it basically means that the tyres that are about to go onto the car aren't allowed to be as warm, which means for tyres like the hard tyres, mid-race, you're putting on tyres that are very, very cold and you kind of have to do an outlap where you're doing a bit of warming up and that costs just so much time. And they just really don't look like they have any grip in a race. They're looking pretty useless, to be honest. See, Matt, the the, the concern is that's, stifling the extra strategy that we want to see well it is a very big concern and it all really goes back to the fact that these tires were tested with last year's cars so they don't have they didn't have an entirely accurate idea at pirelli what they would have to deal with when the new generation cars showed up and we've seen this reflected in the remarkable rise in tire pressures that probably you're requiring. And this is just to keep the car, the tires themselves from going pop in the middle uh, of okay. the race. Wait, I'm going to need some, I'm going to need a, a primer for that, if you like. Uh, what's good and bad about high and or low tire pressure? Right. So for racing cars, you generally like to run your tires under 20 uh, PSI. Um, I don't know what that is in bar, but I'm sure some engineer at home could figure it out and tell us later. And the reason you want to run it there is so that you get the contact patch where the tire literally meets the road to be the correct shape to give you maximum grip. Now, if you're concerned the tire is going to fail structurally, 
the easiest fix is to simply put more air in it. Yeah. But then that makes the contact patch less. And then you have less grip. So they've been up to at Melbourne, it was 21 and a half in the rears and 24 and a half in the fronts, if my memory serves me adequately. Okay, Antonia, it's got to be you next because I'm not following. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it basically just shows that there's a really big disparity and the teams are really struggling to find a balance between the front and the rear sets of tyres and right. the fronts are degrading and graining at a completely different rate that the rears are, which obviously in the middle of a race, if your front tyres are completely gone, but your rears are right where you want them, that's really a struggle and it completely throws the balance of the car. And for teams that are already struggling with that, I think Lewis was complaining about it a couple of weeks ago. If your car's feeling completely all over the place, especially on a high downforce circuit, you're going to really have some big issues. Oh, okay, so are you saying that during the course of a race and during the course of a stint, I think Lance Stroll's comments might echo this you could go from having an understeery car to an oversteery car to a four-wheel drift to then it suddenly being in the right window for a, a few laps yeah exactly if the tires are dropping off and then graining and then they're kind of coming back again i mean you see it with the slicks sometimes they'll get through the tire they'll go through a tire degradation phase they'll kind of level out a little bit and sort themselves out i mean checo perez can go for laps and laps and laps because he manages to get through the graining phase very effectively but uh, if oh, that's all happening at different rates then yeah can i can i sorry i just <laughs> sorry matt i just want to break that down so anytime we can explain why perez is brilliant we, we take that opportunity so okay so the graining is where uh the, the tire skidding across the surface, you're getting little bumps and marbles on the tire, which is reducing the contact patch that Matt's talking about. So you're not getting enough of the tire down. And this passes. Why does it pass? And why is Perez particularly good at, at managing it and where other drivers might fall down? You're going to have to go for Matt for the more technical, but from a Checo Perez side, yeah. his control of the tires is so good because of the way he handles corners and his actual driving style. So his, the way he drives the car is very different to drivers who are much more aggressive on the brakes. So for example, Lando Norris, he goes into turns, brakes very late, very hard, picks up the throttle very quickly. Yeah. Whereas with Checo, he doesn't do that so aggressively, which means that there's less strain on the tires. Okay. So I think Matt, one of the places we really, as viewers could see this was turn 13 at Melbourne where Verstappen in qualifying was continually going deep and then compromising his exit down the main straight. Yeah, I mean, so if we're going to talk about graining, there's cold graining and hot graining. Hot graining clears oh, itself once two you get the tires back into temperature oh. and cold graining clears when you get the tire up to temperature. Okay. And with Red Bull, the problem they had in Australia it was with was exactly with the tires getting over temperature. They didn't find a good balance for the race. And so you could see starting about lap 11 um, that Verstappen's pace relative to Leclerc just absolutely plummeted and that, and that Perez followed him down that path. Whereas at Mercedes, because remember Hamilton was chasing Perez and remember Perez was gone at the beginning yep, of the race. Yep. It turns out that Mercedes had at the end of the first lap, told Hamilton he needed to manage his, his uh, front tire temperatures, 104C, in fact, if anyone is that interested. But that after a number of laps, they said, oh, because we've worn off tread, the tire doesn't retain heat as well. Now we can get hotter. And that's when he began to track Perez down, which is right about when Perez hit that graining phase. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. 100%. Uh, so, <laughs> out of all that, though, what does that mean strategically for the teams? Uh, is is the hard completely useless, Antonia, or is it is it like a very niche thing now, or like a niche circumstance that it will be good? I wouldn't say it's completely useless. And again, as the teams kind of navigate these new regulations, obviously it's always going to be a bit tricky at the start of the season whilst teams figure out the balance of the car, figure out what's working, what isn't. But I think it's going to lead to teams needing to be very flexible with their strategies. I think we're going to see a lot of radio messages going, okay, plan D, you know, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of chopping and changing. Oh, okay. And as we saw, I think it was Stroll, he kind of pitted for the mediums, went back in and got the hards back on again because the, the tyres are just unpredictable. 
A classic example of that would actually be Albon and hitting at the very end of the race. Instead of going on to a medium set of tires, he went on to the soft tire, which immediately had traction and kept him ahead. So I think around the pit stops, especially if you're going onto the harder tire, the gap to the car behind could make the undercut more powerful because it takes longer to get the tire up. And you might be tempted to try and go to it earlier to yeah. make up the time once that tire is up to temperature. So I think we'll see that where we'll really see the strategic focus shifting a bit in the teams. Yeah, I completely agree with your, especially with your point about Albin. I think, he, frankly, I think it was a strategic masterclass from him the other week. And I think he was phenomenal. I think he not only managed the tires very well, pitted right at the end. Obviously, they have to pit at least once for a different tire compound. It was very much a kind of, tick tick in the box make sure they've done the pit stop but mm -hmm. I think I'm frankly side note very disappointed he didn't win driver of the day <laughs> but aside from that yeah I completely agree if the hards can't get temperature into them quickly enough that undercut is going to be very very helpful because if the car in front of you is doing a slow out lap that gives the car behind ample opportunity to get in change tires get heat back in and overtake so what this has done is it's extended the pit stop phase as a viewer. So in the past, like basically if they got to the, the turn one and they're ahead, you go, well, that's it. The undercut or overcut worked. But now you have to go, oh, they came out. <laughs> Those tires are nowhere near ready. Who's who's up the road? So again, a, a, a good incentive to go to the live timing apps and follow those lap charts and see the gaps and keep an eye on them because that pit window where you used to say oh a pit stop here is 20 seconds therefore if he's got a, a 21 second gap he's safe i don't think that's the the case anymore jules you've done a good job staying awake during the tire chat uh, i've been focusing on you you and me we've been looking at each other we've been playing like rock paper scissors to keep ourselves awake but is this is this a uh, luck by pirelli do you think, or is this by, by design? What role have they played in all this? That's a good question. Um, I know. I'm good at this. Yeah. Been, I've been doing um, it ages. I, I don't think uh, Pirelli lucks into anything. I think they, they, uh, they uh, plan and, and execute their work uh, um, uh, yeah. very consciously how it works out. And if teams are happy with it or drivers, <laughs> that's a different question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I suppose, Matt. Uh, the teams are never happy, but we don't hear from Pirelli as much, Matt. We used to, they used to have a, a spokesman that was always talking, but I don't know whether they felt it was bad for their brands because they were getting slated a lot for the chocolate tires. If this is deliberate, I think they probably deserve a lot of credit for adding to the strategy of Formula One. Yeah, well, it is deliberate. Uh, the idea to have tires work like this was taken in conjunction with the FIA and the teams to make the tires like this. And then Pirelli, for commercial reasons, and I think the other teams did as well, wanted the, to move to the, the bigger tires, the 18-inch tires with the smaller sidewalls. So there have been a lot of good things out of it. But I still feel like on a lot of ways with the tires were on the limits, especially looking at the pressures. And I think that we could see either a B spec tire or certainly a pretty big redesign for the following season, because just like we had problems with tires failing in the races with lots of energy going through the sidewalls, I suspect that's still going to be an issue. And that's kind of why we're seeing such high pressures right now. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to get some listener hot takes. Yes, the budget now includes a fire sound effect. I have to let it play out because we've, uh, we've spent money on it, so we need to get value. But I asked our patron Slack group to give us their F1 hot takes. And panel, what I'd like you to do is wave furiously if you've got an opinion on the hot take, and I will go to you. Where's the stop? Okay, stop. That might not be. I'll work on the effects and how they come across. Rebecca has come in with a hot take and says, don't hate me. Mixing names and corners, uh, na names and numbers for corners is very confusing. Get rid of the named corners. Matt. Uh, she's absolutely right. Just done. Yeah. Drivers don't use names. Engineers don't use names. We don't need names. Okay. That's it. Antonio gave you a, a very uh, side eye there. Get rid of names? Uh, no, to be fair, I agree 
from a technical perspective, obviously Hamilton's not going to be coming in around Silverstone being like, oh yeah, I'm at club corner, you know, like it's not, that's not how it works. However, from a fan's perspective, it's nice, especially for home circuits to have designated names for things. I know at the Australian Grand Prix grandstands were named after various drivers. Obviously at Silverstone, we have all sorts of, we have names for every corner. We have the Hamilton straight, we have everything like that. And I think it's nice maybe from a perspective's Spectators, kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah, spectators yeah. perspective however yeah from a driver's perspective and if you especially if you're a fan that doesn't want to sit learning names then it's annoying this might come back to a little bit of our gatekeeping chat that we had <laughs> earlier so you know the commentators go oh yes and uh they're going through club and vale and down the wellington straight into beckett's and luffield at least just stop and go they're going into luffield which is the one that goes on forever to the right and everyone spins out on it and hates it and complains about later so in a way there, there is a kind of a, a price of entry to understand that, but that is gatekeeping, isn't it? Which like you must pay the price of learning all the track corner names, and then you can understand me. I would much prefer one, two, three, four, five, etc. Yeah, but we all had to do it, didn't we? I feel like it's a rite of passage. You, at, everyone at some point has to sit, stare at a map of Silverstone and go, right, maggots, Beckett's, go through the whole thing. If you if you want to yeah. be an F1 fan, that's the one requirement. Oh, may, maybe it's worth, and this is where watching practice sessions helps because that's the time where you can sit and you can get a track map, map up and, and have a, a look around. But yeah, easier for us Brits to look at uh, maggots and Beckett's. We've got Imola coming up next, Matt. So we've got Aqua Minerali. Uh, confetti, uh, and that when it's in a Don't different move, maybe yeah, but when it's in a different language, yeah, Can that's Reno. when that's when you start to lose it, and you need to be a Toscana. Oh, so Matt knows them all. All right, so Matt's I'm just gonna... saying Italian names <laughs> randomly. <laughs> and uh, it's Anvort Jules. It's a tulip corner, a spinny windmill <laughs> hairpin. But, uh, it it has at least one famous corner turn one. It's called the Tarzan uh, turn. Oh, really? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. I think I think. Uh, classic classic turns or like uh, uh, the Lowe's hairpin at Monaco or Eau Rouge, you know, yeah. they deserve to have a name, but especially on the new tracks, uh, it, nobody's going to learn the names. Just just keep it uh, with the numbers. That's always oh, so it's got to earn the name. So it's a yeah. number. Yeah, for yeah the like Senna S is in Brazil or, mm. you know, uh, Parabolica and Monza. Everybody knows what's up, but. You know, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to throw a bone to people who incorrectly think Monaco's fine. Sandvot has probably earned its its name, as has Raskas as well. So there you go. There you go. See, I know some of them, but I would rather stick to the to the numbers. Next, next hot take. Oh, no, I've, I've instantly become sick of that sound effect. That's 50p. I'll never get back. All right, a uh, hot take coming in. Uh, Weitzer van Bruggen. Says Matt, stop mocking me. I'm trying to improve production. Weitzer van Bruggen says, in the end, Lawrence Stroll is nothing more than a Tony Fernandez or other rich guy who thought he could get into F1 and win because of money. Now then, I was told a lot when I was poo-pooing the Stroll project because it's very clearly like a, well, you know, and it's a nepotism project. Lawrence Stroll is a, a fan of motorsport. I get that. But he's pouring the money in that he is now because of his son but i got that thrown in my face going no no he's been in he's he's dedicated to motorsport anyway it's just a coincidence that his his son is there and here's the other classic thing that gets thrown he's a winner he knows about business everything he's done he's won jeans he's done it perfume eau de perfume yeah smells great loves it f1's the same he's gonna smash it but it, it just doesn't tend to work out. Anyone else agree or disagree with that hot take? Any takers, Matt? I'm going to disagree. All right. But only because I don't think Lawrence Stroll got taken for a ride when he purchased the former Force India. Whereas I think Tony Fernandez... I explain who Tony Fernandez is. It was Caterham, correct? Right, that he, there we go. He... he, he he got sold an entry. He was a Malaysian Malaysian businessman, if I remember correctly. If I'm wrong about that, I do apologize. Got sold an entry to Formula One based on the, uh, there's going to be a budget cap, which didn't happen. Very he true. He got sold yeah. on that by Bernie Eccleston. 
And he also, uh, around about the same time, and this is why I feel like he really did get taken for a ride, got sold Queens Park Rangers yeah. by Briatore <laughs> yes. and Eccleston. And I'm like, oh. That's a weird bundle, oh. that one, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. I, they, just, they just found someone who was slightly gullible in, in a brand new area and just sold him all the bad things. All right. And, uh, yeah, well... Okay, but I, I don't know if Lawrence Stroll's motivations might not be similarly debilitating, if, if that makes sense. The, the proof at the moment is I think that the Aston Martin or the, Stro uh, the Lance Stroll project is behind schedule. I think they thought he was going to be up there fighting for race wins by now. And there's a, um, there was a clip of Lawrence Stroll, Papa Stroll, talking to Stroll Jr. when Perez had won a race with Force India. I think it was the Turkish Grand Prix, and he was saying you should have that should have been you. You could have been up there, but it's it's not it's not happening. The the Aston Martin, the the Stroll Junior project isn't happening at the moment. The next hot take, I mean, I paid for it, didn't I? The, the next hot take is from Tom Pints. Hot take panel. Which one of you want in on this? Vettel was inspired by Otmar to join Aston Martin. He'll move to Alpine next year to replace. Alonso, Antonia. Right, so Alonso was sold the Alpine dream with the main tagline being this year. So yes. he was kind of told, wait it out, you know, 2022 is going to be our year fighting. And I find it really difficult to believe, just personally, that Alonso is going anywhere next, at the end of this year, at the end of next Ooh, year, to be that's honest. That's a topic, yeah, okay. Just because he's come in with a very different mentality, to be honest, than I was expecting. He's come in with, I'm actually here to fight for wins. I'm not mucking around. I'm not doing it just because I can or just because I have the time on my hands. He genuinely is back to do well. And I just don't think that with this year being the first year that is, you know, Alpine's year, supposedly, that he'd be willing to go so fast. Well, if you listen to Alonso after the Melbourne Grand Prix, he could he could have won that race three times, Matt. That's it's not so said. much the going fast; it's the finishing that's the problem, I believe. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, it's a topic in itself, though, isn't it? Who is the yeah. who's the principal? Uh, oh, so it's Otmar Schaffnauer. He said that's how you. That's what it's Schaffnauer. Yeah, okay. Schaffnauer. Uh, close enough. Uh, he made that comment, Jules, that Alonso wants to stay on, which is nice, but clearly was referencing Oscar Piastri as well. And understandably so. I mean, he's not wiping the floor with uh, Esteban Ocon. And I'm sure Alonso isn't uh, on uh, one of the lowest salaries uh, within the company. So why would they hang on to him uh, at his age? But going back to the hot take, where, yeah. where's the sound effect? Oh, hang on. To, oh, thank you. Thank you for the direction. The, the problem is, I can't do the hot take and your volume at the same time, so I've got to gently fade it out. There you go, the hot oh, take. Back, yeah, back yeah, to yeah. the hot take, yeah. uh, uh, out of respect of the, the listener who it sent was the Tom. question. Yeah. It would require Sebastian Vettel to go on. And yes, who believes that Sebastian Vettel I, is like going to a different team once more? I, I think Antonia is going to argue. I, I did notice on your TikTok that you were defending Vettel and seemed to be a Vettel fan. And I've been very harsh about Vettel, Vettel uh, in the last week. I, I hold a massive amount of respect for <laughs> of Sebastian course, Vettel. Yes. I, I grew up watching him in his Red Bull era. You know, that was the era of, that Horrible, I remember growing up with. And I, yeah. I really respect him as a person. I think he's a really, really nice guy to have around. Had it. You know, you've seen him with Mick Schumacher, their little camaraderie that's really sweet. But also on track, I think he's a very clean racer. I think he's a very good Well, Now he is. Yeah, you know, yeah, I yeah, think... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I think I think he's really nice to have around, and the thought of him retiring isn't particularly appealing to me. However, yeah. I can see it on the horizon because he won't want to fade out. I think in a, the kind of way Kimi Raikkonen regrettably almost did, and I can't see him making another big jump to another like kind of not top tier team, if that makes sense. Yeah, he hasn't got journeyman ambitions, has he? But yeah, he's clean in green. Is, is maybe something that, that we could say about, about Vettel, Matt? Well, I, I, I tend to agree. I think the linchpin here, I don't see Vettel going to Alpine because if Alonso goes, they're going to just put Piastri in that seat. 
Yeah. So there's no room at that particular end for him, even if Otmar might like him to be there. And even if, you know, looking more carefully at his surroundings at Aston, he might prefer to be there as well. And plus, what does he have, like 97 kids? I mean, you know, the guy's got an entire life outside of Formula One. I don't know how much longer, you know, mm. the kind of results he got in Australia are, are going to keep him motivated to keep to come back. You need to keep track of the amount of kids the the, the drivers have got. Because I've got, got two and my life is ruined. They're, they're truly awful. I've got preteens now. And they're just now, instead of just taking up my energy, they're now nibbling into the core of me and making me realise that I am just a husk for them to feed on so that they can launch into the world. Vettel's got three, which is ridiculous. What other dads have we got on the grid? Perez has got one. He's got one kid. That's why he's kind of, yeah, he's all right. Life's still okay. And we look, Sergio, don't have another one. It's a trick. Don't do it. What other dads are there on the... What other dads are there on the grid? Magnuson, I think. Oh, Magnuson. I mean, he's got a brand new one, so he still thinks it's all fluffy and fine. He doesn't know. Okay, so look, I do think the kid ratio is a factor in Formula One. But I will say, Antonia, as a, a Vettel fan, which you seem to be on some level, Australia didn't look good for him. He didn't look right. He didn't seem motivated. He, he was out of sorts driving. If that was to continue, almost... As a fan, you would want him to realise that he doesn't have to do this anymore. He's very rich. He's got four world titles. Like you can just go chill, and we'll still love you. Yeah, he. I see what you mean. He does seem to have lost a bit of his vettelness, his kind of flair for F one. And I do think, in many ways, he's probably just there because he knows that he can, and he knows, and it's something he loves. Do you know what I mean? It's a huge yeah, part yeah, of yeah. his life. Um, but no, I. It, it is a shame to watch him go from four-time world champion to really not performing very well at all. And I do, I am a bit surprised, to be honest, that he didn't, not pull a Rosberg, but kind of finish a career on a high and then at Ferrari maybe, and then go. I was, I was surprised mm. to see him take the step down. I think, you know, in future with people retiring like Hamilton, I wouldn't be surprised if he takes whatever happens in the next couple of seasons and leaves. But yeah, I yeah, think that's Maybe now. he was sold though. You have to remember that Ferrari let him go. So he got given an option that was sold as, look, we're really, we're heading up here towards the top. A couple of uh, a great comments here in our patron live chat. EJ says, uh, if you had three kids spanners, I suspect you'd want to leave every other weekend. Fair. And Karen has pointed out that Perez has two. No, a girl and a boy and one on the way. Oh, man. Perez, if you're listening to this, you need to get this championship done now before you go down the Vettel route. Uh, one more, one more hot take. Okay. What the, it is from Lucas, who says there's too many races and it's tiring. I can somewhat sympathize so i've grown up in an era where 16 races was very very common a, a race every other weekend on average but actually in reality mostly double headers and triple headers there's very few single races left very few down weekends and it starts earlier it ends later um antonia as a relative relatively new fan i know you've been watching for a long time but compared to us um do you find you get to a point where it's too many races then Jules? Obviously as a fan, no, because it's <laughs> great. But I do see, I think a few of the drivers, you know, there've been a few headlines about whinging drivers with yeah. the calendar. But I do think that what they're saying has some foundation. You know, they are traveling across the world for months on end, jumping from continent to continent. And it's logistically a nightmare for the teams. Sure. You know, yeah. If they're not based in the UK, they're already struggling in terms of actually physically getting the parts everywhere. And for the drivers who, at the end of the day, do have to remember our athletes, you know, going to Australia and not being able to acclimatise to the time zone is knackering. They must be so tired. Yeah, all the spiders they can't acclimatise to. But for, how about from a fan point of view, Jules? Do you, and obviously you've got the same family pressures as as I have, are the family sick of you going, no, it's another race? It, it, true. Um, I could go like, oh, yeah, back in the day, 16 races only, and you had a winter break that lasted five months, so you would be left heartbroken for, for ages before the season started. But 
let's not do old man things. And let me say, I think uh, it should be less because it uh, makes it more punishing if you have a DNF. Because even if uh, uh, Max is, uh, is down 45 points, I think, he could still, you know, easily win this. But if you had only yeah. 16 races and you DNF twice already, that's, that's really punishing. That's your KK Rosberg championship then, isn't it? That kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Matt, is it too is it too many for you? I think we're right on the edge. I mean, I think 24 is the maximum. And that's just slightly less than one every other week. And the problem you run into, and Liberty has said, they want every event to be a Super Bowl. Well, a Super Bowl every other week mm. in metronomic regularity stops being so special. And I think that the dance they're doing commerce wise is is like right on that edge yeah no to be i completely agree actually to be honest a lot of f1 is the spectacle of racing you know look at races like monaco the incoming vegas races you know they are about the splendor of it and all the excitement and the glamour etc and I, I agree if it is an every week or an every other week very regularly then it will lose its kind of glitz and glamour a little bit oh man i'm so disappointed in all of you you are wrong uh, f1 should be every week twice a week i think they should have extra races i uh, oh god i, I can't keep like this the up. one we're about to get it yeah the, the sprint race is where i was trying to segue to but i was i i realized that the way i was going i would have to say that i liked the sprint races so i'll address the first thing first which is yes it's a bit much yes it's a strain on the teams uh, yes, it's a strain on the journalists and the drivers. I get all that. And yes, I'm in this significantly more trouble for, no, that's another weekend we can't do stuff. And okay, fine, I'll miss qualifying. But please, can we just keep your your sister away until 4 p.m. so that I can watch the race? However, all that said, I'm very much a uh, inject it straight into my veins kind of guy with f1 so I, I will take whatever they're giving i've not yet reached the point where i think it's too much i i don't think i'm there yet i know a lot of people and a lot of fans are i would hate to get to the point where hardcore dedicated f1 fans are picking and choosing which races they tune into and say oh, hungaring i'll give that a miss i'll wait for the spectacle of paul ricard uh, but do you know what i mean so that that's that's where i wouldn't want it to go but for me personally i i think i'm i'm okay at the moment um but that does segue nicely into sprint races and i think this will sort of end here with a, a little bit of an imola preview uh, which is next weekend is our first sprint weekend of 2022 i let's have a quick show of hands on the panel who thinks it's th their garbage like total garbage i've got my hand up N seriously am i on my own <laughs> on jules we we connect on so much why do you not hate the sprint races why do you, I, hang on why do you wrongly not hate the sprint races Jeez. i wrongly not hate the sprint races because i'm a bit more balanced on this okay i wouldn't mind them being uh, rid of but um i don't i don't I, th I like i like the fact that there's something more exciting on the saturday than just the the 60 minutes qualifying let me put it that way matt the thing for me is I like the fact that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday each have a thing that's worth watching. <sighs> I, I love that. No. I also like the fact that the teams get hosed out of extra practice, which brings <laughs> that's true exciting yeah. results. Can I be a little bit gatekeeper? -y? Can I have permission just to be a <laughs> tiny bit gatekeeper? -y? <laughs> which is for the longest, longest time. I know everyone is talking about the race, right? And actually, for a long time, people didn't bother tuning into qualifying. It's relatively recent that people would that, that people wanted to make a spectacle of qualifying. Qualifying at one point was an hour open session, and you can just set a lap whenever you wanted in that time. And what would happen was there was no point going out on a green track, so they would wait for it to be rubbered up. So it would be a contest of who could wait the longest, not wasting any resources. And they would all go and set laps in the last five minutes. And whoever set the last lap with a bit of rubber down where would go and get the pole. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. The, 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 the three 
Q, Q1, Q2, Q3 format that's come in is actually the most exciting and, and it works really well. That's the most exciting qualifying I've seen in, in my life of watching Formula One. So, OK, now I accept that other F1, watch, F1 fans watch qualifying as well. OK, that's good. But Friday, Friday was mine. Friday was mine at work and I would... I would not accept any meetings around FP1, FP2 so that I could sit with an ear bud in and listen to Jack Nichols and Jolian Palmer and Jenny Gal going through what was happening in practice. And, and you and me, Matt, we'd have our little edge of, of trying to catch what Andrew Benson said about race pace. And that, that was our, that was our special little thing that we could have as, uh, as hardcore F1 fans. And we could call everybody else bandwagon glamour people for only watching the race bit and how they've taken that from us Matt. they've taken it yeah but you still can watch the first practice and you can watch the saturday practice and what happens in the race isn't always exactly what happens in the sprint race look to me the interesting thing about qualifying is it's a, essentially it's a strategic dilemma am i fast over one lap and i defend in the race or am i fast in the race and i attack from behind and depending upon the arrow regulations mm. it swings one way or the other like now we're seeing more people saying oh race pace matters a bit more than qualifying yeah. doesn't it and that's a relatively new phenomenon that qualifying is not important qualifying used to be like the most important thing to make sure you were on a on a good grid position qualifying for for new fans of f1 qualifying has never been less important than it is in the current era of F1. Jules and then Antonia. Thanks for opening the gate there to new followers. <sighs> but yeah, I know. <laughs> that was not what, what I was going to say. I was going to say, let's not forget sprint races are awarded with more points this season. How, well, how many? Uh, winner gets eight points, I think. Oh, God. So they're just validating this hot mess. Jeez. Yes. Antonia. But let's praise anyone who decided... It wouldn't be like six or even more sprint races, but just the three we had last season. Yeah, I think, I think we're being too harsh on sprint races here. Uh -huh. I really think that they add a nice dimension to the calendar and a new challenge strategically to the calendar that otherwise teams don't get. I think it's really interesting seeing that teams have to kind of rejig what they're doing, rethink strategies, like, 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 like you said, with one lap's pace it's not always going to be transferable to the rest of the race it often isn't so actually having these sprint races i think is really interesting and it gives the teams a new challenge and it's just another thing that can separate one team from the rest of the grid or give other teams the chance to really be contenders matt add to that wrongness uh, i will <laughs> happily add to that wrongness in the sense that it is an interesting strategic problem for the teams because if I am quick enough, I can start at the front and I can defend even in the sprint race. But we saw, and I'll, I'll bring up of the sprint races last year, two of the three had really exciting results. We had Silverstone, which I seem to recall wasn't a boring sprint race. And we also had Brazil with Hamilton making up, oh, you know, easily, what, 16 spots in eight laps or 10 laps or whatever it was. It was, it was absolutely nuts. What's interesting about it, though, is teams, especially with the tires, when I think about Silverstone, everything's about the paddle at the front. But what I think about is Alonzo and uh, perhaps Ocon deciding to set, start on the soft tire, making like five places in the first lap, and then being able to defend that to the end and being in a place he never would have been with qualifying. And so I think we'll see the teams trying to strategically exploit those sorts of things, but more of them. So it's going to be more interesting because it is that risk reward balance. If I crash, I'm toast. Yeah, no, I completely agree. But and I guess there is something to be said about that is a bit of a pitfall maybe of the sprint races is that it places more reward on people who have that kind of race pace and have the ability to defend as well as they do. So for people who are outright, whose outright pace is phenomenal. So for example, George last year in the Williams, he would perform incredibly well in qualifying. And then obviously the actual race pace of the Williams would let him down a bit. He'd slip down the grid throughout the race, but he'd qualify like, you know, P10. And I think 
with the sprint races, it's very harsh on people who perform that way because, of course, it kind of undoes their work in qualifying. Okay, well, it's all very disappointing. Uh, it's it's unnecessary. I'm going to stick to my guns. It's unnecessary. It's weird. They're changing the the stat, so the person who qualifies on pole on Friday is called the pole sitter, and they might uh, DNF on the Saturday and start the race from the back, but they will still have the pole stat. It's not in its finished form. Okay, I, I understand. We want more excitement. We more, want more things happening over more days, and I don't want to be the person who throws the baby out with the bathwater, but it's not in its finished form yet. I don't like it. It's a hot mess. Please don't undervalue qualifying in the in its current form. Qualifying in its current form on a Saturday is brilliant. I want to preserve that. If you want to bring in extra races, can we do it around that? The qualifying in its current form has been going for how many years? A decade? And it's been really good. And it's become like a whole thing. Let's not just give it away on the altar of constantly needing everything all the time. If you want content all the time, we're back here next Tuesday with Sean Kelly, the F1 stat man, the one who provides the stats to everyone in Formula One. When you hear David Croft saying, oh, this is the first time a driver with odd socks has finished in P14 in a country whose third letter is starting with the letter H, that is Sean Kelly that has provided that statistic. So that will be um, on Tuesday. And of course, we'll be here from 8 p.m. next Sunday for our Imola race review. But where do our panel think the podium prizes are going to land? All right. Who's looking all predictory in our panel? Jules Sagers, you are at Jules Sagers F1 on no, Twitter? No, no, oh, no, come no on, man. not the F1. Just at Jules Sagers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jules, and then Sagers is like S-E-E-G-E-R-S. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And you mo- ma- mainly post uh, about your weaving business. You, you like crocheting and uh, creating nice ornaments for houses. But there's the odd F1. Yeah tweet yep. in there as well so people should follow you yeah, and carving clocks from uh, lumps of wood yes it's called but, whittling but let's not get technical what is your podium prediction for imola um let me do something surprising oh, okay. i think it's gonna be hamilton for stopping for the win hamilton for the win yep yep oh it's going to be Ferrari drama on their home ground. Oh, so okay. Hamilton, Verstappen, Bottas. <laughs> or Bottas. Who have you gone for third there, Jules? Uh, I, what did I say? Russell. Russell. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Oh, okay. So we, presumably they're going to fix the porpoising overnight, um, like a light switch. They're going to turn like, it off. Yep. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. Well, let's get a prediction from Antonia Rankin. People can go and check out your your TikTok. Now, I'm not a TikTok expert, but your videos, they're very, very short. They're, they're fun. They're on point. A, a lot of them revolve around, it's, this is hard to explain to people, there are like trends with certain sounds and then you match them to F1 stuff, which is very funny. But you also do some analysis on there and, and you'll have to tell me what a live is because you do some lives as well. Yeah, so basically on TikTok, there'll be like a piece of music or like someone saying something that you lip sync. So it'll be someone saying like, I cannot believe this. Okay. And you kind of, I kind of twist it to apply to a Formula right, One okay. situation. Shoehorn it in. But a lot of them are like a really on point. They're very entertaining. How, how do we go and find it? <laughs> um, so if you just go on TikTok, my at is F1 Antonia. So pretty easy okay. for F1 everyone to remember. Antonia. And what are the live things that you told me about? So basically on TikTok, it's basically a live stream. It's one of oh. my favorite things to do, but it basically means it's kind of like this. I'll come on, basically talk at people. People will, there's a live comment section. So oh, people okay. will ask questions. I'll reply. Yeah. It's, not, it's just a nice way of engaging with people. Okay. Go on TikTok, if only to search for F1 Antonia. And also Chris Stevens, by the way, he's on TikTok, so you can search for Chris Stevens on there as well. Uh, we are starting to take clips out of these shows and we're going to be putting them on, on TikTok because I've been assured that's the right thing to do. Who? What's your podium for Imola? I, okay, I think if the Red Bull 
can get across the line to the end of the race, then I reckon they've got a really decent shot. I think historically, Verstappen's pretty comfortable at Imola. I think this could be a race win for him again if they cross the line. Mm. So I'm going to go Verstappen, then Perez, and then I guess Leclerc again, because it's it's a Ferrari kind of circuit. I think Mm. there's going to be a bit of a home advantage there. But yeah, I think if the Red Bulls can get across the line and actually finish the race, they'll do pretty well. Okay, Matt to Rumpets at MattPT55. Someone was asking about your wife's books, so we need to put a link in the show notes where we can purchase her books. So, I mean, eventually, if she can just become very successful with her her mucky novels, you don't need to do this stuff or trumpeting. You can just buy a Ferrari and be a man of leisure. Yeah, we can buy mm. the VIP Grand yeah. Prix experience and just me. go around to the yeah. races. Okay, so we'll do a link to Amanda's romantic novels in the show notes we'll follow you at mattpt55 on twitter that's that's your main thing to plug yeah um, yep, what's your is. podium for for imola well uh, I'm, i i tend to think this is very much a ferrari kind of circuit relative oh, to the red bull okay it's not what i want to hear all right okay fine so i prefer uh, jules tell you i prefer jules's and antonia's to be honest all right go on then so ferrari you're gonna say I, signs aren't you it might be <sighs> It yeah. might finally be yeah, because I will I will just simply mm. point out that before his entire weekend ran away from him because Ferrari couldn't put the car together <laughs> properly, which could happen good. again. Mm. And you know, we could we could decide what that means in our next series of speculations. But uh, he was actually up on um on Leclerc's uh qualifying lap time before the red flag came out. Oh. Because someone couldn't drive his car all the way around the track. <laughs> who, who was it? I've forgotten. Whose fault it was, was it? Uh, Alonso, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, it's Alonso's failed. fault. Yeah. Okay. So what's your podium? So it's uh, Le- Signs? Signs, Leclerc, and then a uh, uh, driver to be named later. Okay. Uh, Jules, you had an in on that? Yeah, I, I, I thought Matt would go for Esteban Ocon, of course, as Could Alpine. Be are probably the only team who have announced uh, like big upgrades for Imola. This yeah. is true. Everyone is else this, is... Uh, is this you ditching Ocon and taking Carlos into bed? Well, this is me thinking they have one practice session and who knows how the developments will actually work. Okay, so I'm going Fair for... I, I, I was seduced by Jules' Ferrari drama. So, y- yes. Let's have Ferrari, unfortunately, going to Ferrari at Imola. They're going to just, just scrape some, some points. Decent damage limitation in the end, actually, as it turns out. Verstappen will overdrive the dominant Red Bull uh, at the weekend and the problems that have plagued Gasly's car, who I believe was experimenting engines. He was using experimental engines at the start of the season for Verstappen. He will retire. Um, Verstappen will also retire. Perez uh, takes the win. And uh, and I like the the sight of the the two Mercedes coming in second and third. What's up? What's up, Jules? I I just had an had an epitome, and I checked the weather. Oh, oh no! Weekend. Go on. And it says rain. Is it? It says rain on Friday, on Saturday, Sunday. Of course, it's still a long way to go. It's just one weather mm-hmm. thing telling me this, but there's hope. Oh, well, there you go. Vettel win confirmed. Fantastic. Please, guys, please do and go uh, go and follow my panel. Go and follow Antonia Rankin on TikTok and go and click the link in the show notes below on YouTube and in your podcast player. Follow Jules Sagers at Jules Sagers on Twitter. Follow Matt at MattPT55 and the links to his wife's books. Uh, she's A Weaver Writes on Twitter. And, and for goodness sake, follow me at Spanners Ready. I'm the best one. Thank you so much for getting me to 10,000 Twitter followers. I know it's an arbitrary number and it is just uh, pure attention seeking, but I really, really enjoyed that. So thank you so much for uh, for following me on Twitter. Follow the account uh, for the show as well at Missed Apex F1. And if you enjoy what we're doing here, maybe you'd consider being a patron and getting some extra content and joining us in our patron Slack group. That's patreon.com forward slash Missed Apex. The link is also in the show notes below. Uh, We'll see you on Tuesday for a live stream in the evening with Sean Kelly, the F1 stat man. And then we'll see you on Sunday for the Imola Grand Prix race review, 8 p.m. Join us live. Until then, work hard, be kind and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. Thank <laughs> you.